Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Dan Barker, co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of atheists and agnostics. For more information on FFRF and our activities, go to FFRF.us. Leanne Lord is an award-winning stand-up comedian who has appeared at comedy clubs and festivals around the world and has entertained U.S. troops in many countries. She's the author of several books, including Real Women Do It, Standing Up. She has written for the Huffington Post and for the pilot of the Chris Rock Show. She's a co-host of Star Talk with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Leanne Lord is frequently heard on XM Sirius Satellite Radio and has been seen on ABC, BBC, HBO, and Comedy Central. Leanne gave us a hilarious show at our annual convention in San Francisco, where Annie Laurie and I were able to sit down with her for a few moments. So, Leanne, you are, you're living the dream. When you were, <laughs> you, when you were a young girl, you knew that you wanted to be a stand-up comic. Well, I, I, I'm not sure how we're defining young girl. Um, I, I think it, the bug really, really hit me in college, because that's when I started doing theater and performing on stage. I mean, theater is very different from stand-up, but uh, I guess you could say the entertainment bug uh, got me there. And you went to college and graduated, and then you told your parents what you wanted to do with your life. Yeah, well, I, I was trying to be a good girl, you know, get my degree, go to school, you know, go to college, you know, go to get a corporate job, and I really, really hated it. And yeah, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do and finally figured out that it was stand-up, but I was nervous about telling my parents because they had invested in me. They thought I was going to have this corporate career. And I decided to talk to them separately because, you know, divide and conquer. And I told my dad first because he's the easier touch, so I thought. And I said, Daddy, I've really thought about this I, and I want to do stand-up. And he turned to me and he said, what took you so long? Uh -huh. <laughs> He knew you were funny. He knew. I mean, well, well, him and my mom, very, very funny people. You know, I, I feel like I grew up with a lot of laughter and storytelling. I mean, I tell you all the time, I'm not the funniest person in my family. I'm just the only one that wants to be paid to do it. Paid in front of total strangers. In front of total strangers, uh -huh. you know, in case, you know, my therapist is unavailable. Yes, uh -huh. total strangers will fit the bill. <laughs> so, Leanne, you were also brought up Catholic. I was. I was. But not... Right away, I, my mom put me in Catholic school because she just wanted the best school in the neighborhood, and it turned out to be Catholic. Um, I think if the best school in the neighborhood had been Wiccan, I might be a practicing witch. So it really was what she thought was best. So I didn't start Catholic school until third grade. So I wasn't indoctrinated from the very beginning, but I did spend grammar school and high school. Uh, in Catholic school. Well, the Jesuits say, give us a child to till he or she is seven and they're ours for life. So you escaped I that. I missed it. I missed it. I started just past the age of reason. So I, I figured, you know, by that point, if Santa Claus, you know, wasn't standing up to scrutiny, Jesus didn't have a chance either. Can we say Santa Claus doesn't exist on this show? <laughs> you know, I, I've, I have a more liberal definition of Santa Claus now. So, <laughs> so you must have gone into that school with a lot of questions. I that... did. I did. And it, 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 again, it was a big shift from public school to, to Catholic school where we had religion class every day. And about once a week, they would bring the priest in. And everyone was afraid of the priest. No one wanted to ask questions. And I didn't understand why I was supposed to be afraid of this guy. So I'm raising my hand, mm. asking questions like, no, this doesn't make sense. And I turned out to be one of his favorite kids mm. because I would engage and not really believe everything he was telling me. So I, again, I'm a kid. I don't really have a lot of choices. So I'm there. I'm participating. But I'm like, eh, this doesn't really seem. Uh, so was there a point when you actually decided, I don't believe any of this. I'm an atheist. Um, I think my path was gradual. You know, there were things that happened along the way. And I think one of the big turning points for me was when I graduated and left Catholic school and I went to a, you know, a public university and I start meeting other people who were very nice, people who were supposed to be going to hell <laughs> because they were in a different religion. Well, wait a minute, they're nice. And so that started opening my eyes, you know, to different religions, different people, and then understanding, well, they can't all be right. And then, so that questioning started, and nothing really held up to the scrutiny. And uh, I tried. I truly tried to hold on. But there was nothing to hold on to, you know. So, yeah, I, I went from, you know, Catholic to spiritual to free thinker to, you know, whatever you want to call it now, humanist, atheist. None you know. of the above. Yeah, none of the above. So you have been part of 
public relations on free thought and humanism, part of Center for Inquiry, yes. I think, was it a billboard? Yes, uh, the Center for Inquiry um, and African Americans for Humanism did a campaign several years ago. And it was a very uh, gentle outreach campaign, just simply to let people know that if you have questions, you're not alone. And uh, the, the, the program went up in seven cities. I was the New York face of the campaign. And my face was on billboards and you know bus you know uh, station. It was it was just amazing. And I, I found most of my friends would take pictures and send it to me, and still not know what the campaign was like. What are you doing? You're an ad. What's going on? Uh, what was very cool was that uh, someone took pictures of of the campaign, you know, on the bus shelters and in the subway, and they made copies of the photos and sent it to my mom. And my mom, who is like black belt Catholic, like super religious. Uh, she saw the pictures and she was proud that I was doing something that I believed in. Because we had that conversation when I was 18. I told her, I said, I don't believe this. And going to church makes me feel hypocritical and I don't want to do it anymore. And she was upset, but she respected me. She believed that her and my dad gave me a strong enough foundation to make the right decisions. And she let me do that. Which, looking back, is an amazing gift for a parent to give a kid. When, they, when they're going off on a path that they, the parents don't understand. And so for her to see the pictures, and she put it in a frame, she put it right on the living room table. She was actually proud that I had done it. So you so, have a good family. You, you love each other. Then. Yeah, 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 I do have a good family. I'm not saying we're perfect, you know, we're not the Cosbys, even though you can't say Cosby anymore. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I, I do like to think I come from a, a good family. A you use the phrase background. black belt Catholics? Yeah. Didn't, didn't you do something in martial arts for a while? I did. I, I was a, I've always loved martial arts. I was a practicing martial artist yeah. and I did, uh, it got out of hand. I was just trying to stay in shape and uh, went on to earn my black belt. And it was a very pivotal year. I got my black belt and then we got a black president. It was great. So it might have been <laughs> handy if you have a nervous audience that you're telling a religious story to, you know. <laughs> I saw you do a thing, uh, what was it called, Knocked Up by God, where oh, the right. Virgin Mary, uh, and the audience was kind of nervous when they were laughing. Oh, yeah. Well, see, that's how comedy works. You, you get them out there on the edge, you make them a little nervous, and then you bring them back. And, right. and um, the joke, if I'm remembering it correctly, was just positing the, the question that, you know, if Mary could come home and say that, you know, she was pregnant by God, you know, she was the mother um, of Jesus, I, well, I could, be the, I could be the virgin mother of Tyrone, huh? you know, which um, they laugh even though they don't want Except to. You said that she blew it for all women because she, she, yeah, used, she, it, she used it already and no one else Yeah, she that. messed it up for all women. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's the one excuse. You get, you get one time with that and she used it. Hmm. Now, speaking of families, you did a very, very funny routine uh, at Thanksgiving one year. Yes. About what is it? Six things to talk yeah, six, about. Yeah, this was I think this started I guess around 2016, you know, as the acrimony was building in the country and you know, people were like, wow, what are we going to do with Thanksgiving? You know, cuz that's when the family gets together and you realize not everybody has the same political opinions. And so I wrote offhandedly a, a funny piece, six things to argue about at Thanksgiving other than politics. <laughs> so let's watch that. Well, the holidays are here, and that means some of you might be spending a lot of time with family, with people that you love and can marginally tolerate. And just because you have shared DNA, that doesn't mean that you have shared political opinions. So that can lead to some heated arguments about politics, about who's right and who's wrong. Well, you're right and they're wrong, but if you want to do something a little different this year, I have a list of six things that you can argue about instead of politics. The first is money. When people come over to the house for dinner, be sure to collect a cover charge at the door from everybody who didn't bring a dish. And make it easy, use a square. Also, ask to borrow money from someone you've already borrowed from but have yet to pay back. Make no mention of the previous monies owed. The second thing you can fight about is weight. If someone's gained weight since last year, mention it as dinner is being served. If someone has lost weight and they look great, say nothing. The third thing that you can fight about is love. If someone is single, be sure to ask when they're getting married. If someone is married, be shocked it's lasted this long. If someone's divorced, ask lots of questions about their ex. Be sure to mention how much you like and miss them and wonder aloud whether or not they should have been invited to dinner. 
The fourth thing to argue about, sex and gender. If you're gay, go on ahead and out a heterosexual family member. Be sure to mock their chosen lifestyle and say there was always something a little different about them and that you'll pray for them. Well, for bonus points, uh, question the gender identity of the turkey. The fifth thing to argue about, religion. When it's time to say grace, turn it into a religious filibuster. Like, just keep talking. Use any and all prayers except the ones from the religion that your family follows. If you're an atheist, be sure to transition with, oh, here's another funny one. You'll know you've done well when someone has to reheat the gravy. The sixth thing to argue about, tradition. Like, instead of asking the oldest family member, ask the youngest family member to carve the turkey, no matter how young they are. Like, what's more exciting than a knife-wielding toddler? Or you can ask the vegetarian to do it. Every family has one. They're usually the ones skulking and sulking around the salad. If all else fails, go on ahead and argue about politics. But really do it. Like, make sure you talk about somebody's mama, like even if you have the same one. You know, just let it descend into chaos, like an all-out food fight. And then at the end of it, come together as a family and help clean up because the person who would normally do it has probably been deported. Happy holidays. So that is so funny, Leanne. Thank you. I, I, I want to thank you guys for asking me to do that. You know, that I, I had just done it in print and then you said, can you put it on video? I'm like, what? And it was actually a lot of fun to do and it's actually become annual. I post it annually so people remember. We don't have to fight about politics. There's other stuff. There's a lot of other There's a things. lot of other stuff. Get creative. Be a family. <laughs> other things to fight about besides politics. Other yeah. things. So, um, so we'll talk about your writing because that was something you wrote, and you've done a lot of writing. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you were called the Urban Irma the after... The Urban Irma. I, w I grew up being a big fan of uh, Irma Bombeck, and I loved her, her short, funny stories, yeah. and I started doing that as well, but I'm not, you know, a rural housewife from Ohio. <laughs> I'm more the urban version of her, and someone actually coined that term, like, oh, you're like the Urban Irma, and I loved it, and that became the title of my blog then. So you have a blog that... The Urban Irma. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's my older blog. I don't I don't do it anymore. But um, because of it, I actually now have an association with the Irma Bombeck Writers Workshop. They bring me in every two years oh. to. Uh, I've given a keynote. I've taught for them, and it's a, it's a wonderful relationship that started because of that blog. So you grew up in a different neighborhood. You said that you re didn't realize till later that you were actually growing up in the hood. I had no idea I was in the hood. None whatsoever. My parents were so protective of me. You know, youngest child, only girl. Uh, they sent me to, to Catholic school, you know, private school. They knew exactly where I was going, when I was going. They're the type of parents that they would call the home of the friend I was going to to make sure they knew their parents and that someone was going to be home. So it was very protected, which means my early adulthood was shocking. <laughs> I had a lot to learn. There was Little Jamaica or something? or a... I, I, my, The town is called Jamaica, uh, South Jamaica, actually. South Jamaica. Which is nothing like Jamaica, Jamaica at all. We're going to go out on the break, but ah. uh, it, you, you did uh, write something about 9-11 or have an experience. I do, you? yeah. I'm, I'm a New York City girl, born and raised, and so, I, yeah, I do have a 9-11 experience. We're talking with Leanne Lord, a very funny lady, stand-up comic, and after the break, you'll tell us a story about what happened two days after 9-11 in New York City. Yes. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name is Jarvis, and I'm an out-of-the-closet atheist. There are many reasons why I'm an atheist, but I'll start with the crudest explanation. I'm sure many of you have seen Clash of the Titans or The Immortals or 300, these blockbuster films about ancient Greek or Roman religion, which we now call mythology. But back then it wasn't mythology. It was very real for them. They genuinely believed that you had to put a coin in a person's mouth before they were buried so that they could pay for the literal ferry to the afterlife. Just as many people today believe that they should 
eat crackers and wine on a Sunday or that God wants women to hide their bodies under black burqas. Every religion that has ever existed, and there are many, have all believed that they were right, that their rituals and rules and beliefs were 100% correct, and they all thought they nailed it. But where are they today? Uh, if they're not completely forgotten, they're on the silver screen, amusing us with their sword fights, animal sacrifices, and oracles. The religions of today are the entertainment of tomorrow. Everyone, I hope, is an atheist about Zeus and Apollo, Juno and Poseidon. I just added Jesus and Muhammad to that list. And we're back with Free Thought Matters. I'm Dan Barker with Annie Laurie Gaylor, and we're talking with a very funny lady, <laughs> Leanne Lord. And you live in New York City, and you were in New York City on 9-11, yes. and did you have to cancel some gigs after that? Well, I actually had a gig scheduled for two days after, September 13th, uh, in New York City uh, at New York Comedy Club. And I kept thinking, there's no way we're going to have a show, that we can't have a show. And still, I drove in, I went into the city, and I walked into the club and was surprised mm -hmm. that uh, the other comics who were supposed to be on the show, they were there, and we had an audience. And it turned out that folks needed to laugh. That, that, would, that, that after such a horrific event, that they needed the sense of community. They needed that sense of laughter. They needed to be in a room with people having a good time. And it was one of the first times I realized that what I do, it's not rocket science, it's not heart surgery, but it helps. It's therapy. It's therapy. It's therapy. And also getting people together in yeah. the same room yeah. after 9-11, that would have been it, very reassuring. It was. It, it actually was. And so I'm glad that they didn't cancel the show. I'm glad that I went and that we got to have that, that experience together. And when people are laughing, there's some kind of a chemical drug to the brain I wanna, that makes you feel... Endorphins. I want to say it's endorphins. Yeah. You know, you... you it doesn't fix all the problems, but you know you get that surge of, of chemicals, of, of, of endorphins, and it, it allows you to take that cleansing breath. So let's take a look at a snippet from your stand-up comedy at the Freedom from Religion Foundation. I, uh, I actually have a little um, confession to make. I missed the first 15 minutes um, of his talk. Yeah, yeah, and, and here's what happened. I got caught outside of, of, of the area, um, two ladies saw my conference badge, my convention badge, and they said, well, what is, what is the group about? You know, what, 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 what are you guys doing? And there was nobody, none of you guys were there. <laughs> it was just me. I'm like, holy crap, this is it. I'm on. And I said, well, um, the Freedom From Religion Foundation was started in 1976. <laughs> It went national in 1978. And the purpose is to ensure, uh, through education and litigation, that we maintain the separation of church and state as it was outlined and intended in the United States Constitution. How about? They, uh, they were not impressed. They were Jehovah's Witnesses. I guess I, what I can define myself now is, if we have to put a label on it, I guess it's easy for me to say um, that I'm a humanist. And actually, that's very difficult to say, because human beings are a very hard species to love. <laughs> I guess that makes me more of a dogist. Uh, <laughs> Dogs are amazing. I mean, life is just better with fur in it, right? I, I, I honestly think, you guys, the world would be so much of a better place if we all treated each other half as good as we treated our pets. Right? Oh my God. I would be in heaven if every day somebody rubbed me on my tummy and said, who's the best girl in the whole world? I, um, we were talking about this at, at breakfast too. You know, you, you say humanist, and that you know sufficiently confuses people. 
you know, they, they don't really challenge it. You know, you take away the sugar coating, you know, atheist, <laughs> right? Which, in my uh, world, how that affects me in my everyday life is that my friends don't ask me to be a godmother. <laughs> Which is fine, because I don't believe in children. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, as I was trying to explain to my Kool-Aid ladies, um, <laughs> freedom of religion also means freedom from religion, right? This is, but if you choose, if you choose something, that's cool. What you don't get to do is impose it on other people. Right? I, I, I don't even think children should be raised in religion. I think you should get to adulthood and pick. And I think you should pick your religion based on your personality, because that makes as much sense as anything else. Right? Like, if you're, if you're laid back, practice Zen. If you love nature, be a druid. Yeah. If you're in a hurry, switch to Geico. You know? The... Well, that was very funny, very yeah. funny evening for us at the Freedom From Religion Foundation. For me as well. Now, you have written two books. Yes. And what are they called? Um, the first book, I will uh, enunciate it, Dict Jokes, that is D-I-C-T. Like dictionary? Like, like dictionary. It's short for dictionary. And the whole premise of the book is that words would be more fun if they meant what they sound like. You know, for example, uh, grammatology sounds like it should be the study of grandmothers. It's not. <laughs> um, but the, the, yeah, the, the, the book is filled with words like that. There's actually a volume one and a volume two now. Give us a couple more examples. Uh, histrionics uh, sounds like it should be the history of Ebonics. <laughs> Ebonics. Ebonics. Um, forte. Uh, the average age of a midlife crisis. Uh. <laughs> so yeah, these are all wrong. These are all terribly wrong, but funny, mm. uh, hopefully. Uh, what, I, what I like, what I've done in the book is that no matter where you flip to, whatever word you choose, I give you the real definition, it's real part of speech, and then my alternate definition. So you can accidentally learn something. I don't leave oh, with yeah. the learning. I don't leave with the learning because people don't want to learn anything. But there were uh, a lot of words I didn't know. Yeah, oh, there are tons really? of words. I was an English major in, in school, so that's part of my fascination with, with words and language. But and your book makes a way to look at reality kind of sideways. Yes. You, you look at a normal thing, but you can go like this and go, hey, mm -hmm. that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, what was fun for me was uh, I actually got an editor for the book, because you can't edit your own stuff. You're just too close to it. And um, when he sent back the notes, it, at first it started, you know, very formal, you know, in the margins, you know, it was like, okay, change this, add this. And then he starts adding, ha, 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 that was funny. Ha, I see what you did there. Ha, this is great. When is this coming out? It was, so when you can get someone, you know, sort of engaged uh, and as, as excited as you are about what you're doing, you know you've got something kind of like you guys. I have about four or five joke comedy books on my shelf, and yours is one of them. Really? Oh, I love it. I love it. And then a book about real women. It's, it's called, and it's sort of written in the, in the fashion of one of Irma Bombeck's books, and it's called Real Women Do It Standing Up. Stories from the career of a very funny lady, which would be me. Uh, and it, it's really, I guess, a memoir told in little short, funny, poignant stories, the way Irma Bombeck might have done. And it's, it's got stories in there about how, when I first started stand-up, what it was like going out on the road, what it was like trying to be married and be on the road and be a dog mom and all, and all my concerns about the business and just my 25-year my journey because I can't believe it's been 25 years. 25 years that you look way too young for that uh, to be true. I started when I was three, so thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, any experiences, any squirmy kinds of experiences, it must be scary often to go up on stage and not know whether you're going to bomb or whether you're going to be a success. You know, it's, it's funny you say that. People ask me all the time, they said, how can you get on stage? And I say, how can you not? Hmm. The on stage is where I feel comfortable. You know, that's, you know, I remember the first time I stepped on stage, it was like, oh, like hmm. this is where I'm supposed to be. Um, I, I was doing a gig uh, with a friend and he brought his dad and his dad was walking with us into the building and he goes, so you guys have never been here before? And I'm like, no. So you've never seen this audience? No. So you don't know what you're walking into? No, sir, mm. we don't. And this is, I almost felt like I should have had a cape on with, it, with, the, <laughs> with the wind blowing in the background. I'm like, yes, we're comedy superheroes. We never know what's going to be there when we show up. But experience teaches you to make the best of it. But that's amazing because a lot of people say their number one fear is public speaking. That tells Not you something's a little wrong with me. <laughs> oh, that's, well, 
When I had my, I'm sorry, when I had my first speech class, no one in the class wanted to do it. I was the only kid that went, I get to talk? And they're gonna listen? Can I go first? And I never wanna go first at anything, but I was just so excited at the prospects that I kind of figured out I'm a little different. So Leanne, do you typically or ever work your religious views or non-religious views into your comedy? I do sometimes. It's very difficult because depending on what part of the country you're in, yeah. uh, people are very resistant. And even if it's funny, they want to be offended first yeah. before they see the humor in it. Uh, so I, I, I try to work it in gently. Um, but I'm not shy. I'm not shy about it. But I, I often tell people I'm not an atheist comic. I'm a comic who's an atheist. So, Because I still feel when I get on stage, my primary job is to entertain and to make people laugh. And if I can't do that, I'm doing something wrong. Yeah, if they're going to have their backs up, it, it won't work. Right. No, not at all. You're featured in Chris Johnson's book, A Better Life. Yes. It's a great photo of you giving a com comedy routine. Mm -hmm. and, and then there's uh, like an essay. And in the essay, you say, you think the human race is taking itself too seriously. Yeah. And what do you say? I can do something about that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, I think, one of the gifts that stand up allows me to bring to people. We can laugh at our own foibles and laugh at mm -hmm. those things where we've just gone a little too far. Um, and I think that's what laughter allows us to do. Like, we go, oh, yeah, that is ridiculous. Hmm. Yeah. And maybe religion takes things too seriously, too. You think? <laughs> Yeah, it, it, yeah, a lot of the, the places where we go wrong is religion, and that's in trying to impose and tell people, particularly women, uh, what we can and cannot do. Uh, so yeah, you're right. Well, thank you so much, Leanne. You're a very funny lady. Thank you for joining us thank today. You. On... Thank you. I'm sorry I'm not funnier in the interview, but I'm like so engaged in having a conversation with you guys. You're just funny when you talk. You don't even have to say anything. It's just you just have that voice. That's uh, and that face. <laughs> can I say this? It is a gift, right? From where? From where? <laughs> <laughs> From genetics and hard work. How about that? Yes, okay. I, it, like you believe with your piano. Yeah. When it, people say that to you. It's a gift that you have to spend decades working on. How about that? Yeah. Yeah, no, you know, well, just drops you. it on you. Well, thank you so much, Leanne, for joining us on Free Thought Matters. Because Free Thought Matters. <laughs>